Welcome to our virtual space, where thought leaders who in a variety of ways have committed themselves to improving our lives, share their work, perspectives on current affairs, and what brought them to where they are today. My name is Rob Liu, and this is The Exchange. So Glenn, thank you for joining us today on The Exchange. As you know, this is sort of a group of individuals that are coming together in conversation, in interview, to really talk about their work, talk about their work as it relates to the life sciences, but in particular in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, how it might have changed what's actually happening in their work, both currently and going forward. So um, to me, one thing that I think is incredibly exciting is that you've done an enormous amount of work, very exciting work, in the intersection of the law and medicine and health, and in particular in the realm of bioethics. But before we get to that, I think our viewers and listeners are very interested in who Glenn Cohen really is. And so there are like a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you to crack that open. I'm for, loving it. Go ahead. For our audience. So I think it's fair to say that um, for many of us, we do a lot of different things. And so one question that I'd love to pose to you for our audience, on behalf of our audience is, Glenn, what is it that you do? How work you Talking about my work. So my work is uh, the intersection of law and medicine. So that's pretty broad. So that's everything from reproductive technologies, gene editing, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration regulation, human subjects research, the globalization of healthcare, questions about the regulation and liability of physicians. Uh, and it's really broad. The law school I teach, I also teach civil procedure, which is the basics about how to bring a civil lawsuit. Because I spent a time before academia as a uh, appellate lawyer for the Justice Department, where my job was defending the president and the agencies. That's a piece of it too. And at law school, I teach courses on reproductive technologies and genetics, health law. I teach a fun course that's bioethics and film where the students watch films and we talk about it. And I teach civil procedure. Wow. So that's a truly impressive range of things. Um, and so given sort of that breadth, here's sort of an interesting question. It's often the case, and I think it's almost always the case, that in, when we think about where we are today and we think back to our past, that there's usually an event, a person, an experience that we could probably point at and say, you know what, that played an important role in who I am today. Can you share with us perhaps an event, person, or experience? Great. So let me pick a couple because I think I've thought about this before, so I actually have an answer. The first was when I was in grade six, I grew up in Canada. When I was in grade six, I went to a board game night at a friend's house and their sister was in med school and their sister was taking a course in bioethics as part of med school in Montreal. And that was the first time I heard the term and I was very curious what it meant. So that was one piece of it. Uh, the other is when I was an undergraduate, I took a bunch of philosophy courses. I started off thinking I wanted to do international relations, that kind of stuff. I took a course in that, but I took a bunch of philosophy uh, courses and in particular courses in Greek philosophy. And I was just incredibly inspired by the method and the way of thinking that for me, it made it clear to me that whatever I did, I wanted to have some of that analytical rigor of philosophy. And the third is I applied to law school. I got into Harvard. I was thinking about doing a PhD in philosophy concurrently. Back in that time, they only let you basically count courses to one or the other. Now we have a much better system. So I said to myself, well, you know, I'll do the law degree. And then if I ever want to come back and do the philosophy PhD, I can always do that. And it's kind of a story of way leads on to way leads on to way. And they've had all these amazing opportunities. And I've hung out with philosophers, which a lot of time reading philosophy, but I realized I liked uh, the legal side of it better. And maybe just one more in this Greek philosophy course that I took in undergraduate, my amazing professor who's really inspiring. Towards the end of class, he said once to us, look at Raphael's painting, The School of Athens. You have the Plato clutching the Timaeus, gazing towards the heavens. Those are the metaphysicians. And you have Aristotle clutching the Nicomachean ethics, grazing towards the ground. And those are the ethicists. And you have to make a decision which of the two you're going to be with your career. 
And as I joke, I decided to be way in the sewers because I'm a lawyer who's philosophically trained, not even the ground, right? So the ground wasn't low enough for me in terms of philosophical stuff. But those are kind of the influences that I had that led me to my pathway. Oh, that's fantastic. Because what you do today is so profoundly interdisciplinary, right? It, it, it really connects so many fields. And in fact, I've heard this said about you many, many times that you really, one of your great powers is your ability to sort of assume the perspective of another field and really inspect, for example, the law or medicine or what's happening in society from a perspective that might be a little bit different, right? I think that's, that's exactly right. And for me, I often joke, I tell my students with this, that one of the greatest privileges of working at Harvard is often feeling like the dumbest person in the room constantly. And then when they feel like they're not getting something, they should feel excited because that means when my learning is maximal. So often I feel like I'm getting a graduate level education in linguistics or antitrust economics just from hearing my colleagues present papers and the like and talking to people. So I'm a total sponge in terms of the way in which I learn. Fantastic. So um, um, this spring, I think we all sort of went through a dramatic change in the face of COVID-19. And I know, for example, um, my own experience, I was teaching a course on cell biology and global health at the time. And um, I started my first sort of online lectures and discussions talking about COVID-19 as part of it. And then after, my, after the second time I did that, I said to my students, okay, have you actually heard enough about COVID-19 now? Should I stop this? And they said, no, no, no. Unanimously, the 80 students wanted every class to really touch on that in some way. And what I discovered was just how easy it is to take this pandemic that we're all in at the moment and connect it with just about everything imaginable. So in terms of your work under the pressure of the pandemic, are there particular issues that you think about a lot that you feel have really been especially impacted? Absolutely. So I think among them, you know, so it's funny that I've taught a health law course several times and we do about two classes worth out of 12, let's say, on topics of public health law. And, you know, I think now post COVID, I feel like what I spend time on those two classes, all of it has come up as applied to COVID in sort of interesting ways. For me, probably I think the most interesting topics, and there's a lot of them. I joked, I kept a running list of things that I had written about or been asked about, everything from the power of the federal versus the state governments in these areas, and can one state bar residents of another state to digital contact tracing and immunity passports to ventilator allocation. It's just a huge variety of things. I think the stuff that's been the most interesting to me is probably two of the pieces. One is the question about um, allocation and just allocation. So bioethicists for a long time have had a lot of principles about thinking about allocating scarce goods in general, everything from vaccines to ICU beds uh, to organs. And I should say, although I'm not speaking on their behalf, I also sit on the government's commission that handles setting policies for the allocation of organs, OPTN. So I've dealt with this in real life as well. We have a pretty well settled set of principles. There's some debates around the margins. The thing I think that's been the most interesting has been to see the way in which the disability rights committee, community I should say, intersects with these principles. And in particular, the idea of looking at life here. So it's very common in many rationing systems to consider between two possible claimants, looking at who would get more life years out of a good. And the, what's been interesting is to see the way in which that has both legally and ethically been deeply attacked by the disability rights uh, community in a way that I think was somewhat unexpected, in part because this principle underlies many forms of allocation we do right now in medicine, including organs. So that's been one thing that's been very interesting. Mm -hmm. I would say the other that's been particularly interesting, and again, there's a ton to talk about here, has been some of the stuff about setting conditions about re-entry to the economy and really trade-offs between privacy on the one hand and public health on the other. And there's some people who say, well, it's not really a trade-off, and I, I'm sympathetic to this idea, but I do think there are some hard choices. And one of the most interesting things I've seen has been uh, Google and Apple, who I think most people view as not the behemoths in favor of privacy, that they are threats to our privacy. In terms of the way in which they have proposed using their phones and their systems to do uh, assistance of public health authorities has been extremely privacy protective. 
So much so that I actually think it's created systems that probably are not going to be particularly effective. And that is such an interesting reversal of the typical narrative about big tech that I found that quite fascinating. But there's lots of interesting things to talk about. Those are just two that jump to mind. Well, I think what, what I really appreciate is the fact that you jumped into two things that are really about outcomes and action, right? Things that have sort of immediate effect. And so when you think about bioethics and the ethical implications of things, you're already speaking to sort of direct translation into policy, into resource allocation, et cetera. The reason why I'm really struck by that is that quite often, and as a cell biologist, when we think about stem cell biology, CRISPR, et cetera, what troubles me a little bit is that very quickly um, discussions of the ethical implications of anything spin very fast into issues of what does it mean to be human? What is the nature of informed consent? What is free will? Privacy, rights, things that are, are key and important, but they become rapidly so abstract that you sort of sometimes leave these discussions and I have thinking, okay, this is all very provocative and I could go home and think about this for months, but what are we going to actually do in response to it? So I, I, I'd like to ask you, Glenn, I mean, this notion of how bioethics translates into actual things that we experience every day, can you give us some more insight or examples into that? Yeah, and I'd say one of the things that's interesting about bioethics as a field is it lacks a kind of centralized theoretical apparatus that many other fields have. It's evolved as a kind of mishmash of practical and applied ethics. In its early days, it was dominated, I would say, first by religious scholars, then philosophically trained people. And then in more recent days, much more involvement of lawyers, physicians, and people who are, you know, but it has this practical aspect in that most, many bioethicists serve and have to make practical calls, whether it's on an ethics committee deciding what should happen in a hospital based on a tough case, an institutional review board that's going to review or advising uh, policymakers. So there's a lot that's kind of, uh, I think, really uh, kind of important and practical here. But just to give you a real, very tangible example or two really tangible examples. So let's continue the examples I started with, right? So you are deciding when we had the surges of demands in the early days in New York, whether physicians should be allowed both to withhold ventilators and even more interestingly, to withdraw the ventilators from people who had low chances of good prognoses in favor of people who were waiting, who had much better chances of a good prognosis. Yes. And so that is a practical question. You have to make a decision as to who is going to get the ventilator, whether the law is going to protect you if you withdraw, how you formulate the policies, who you engage with, what protections are in place. Uh, another example, uh, again, is uh, digital uh, contract tracing and exposure notification, right? So should individual states, for example, use the Google, uh, Apple, MIT model, which is based on having cell phones uh, kind of in proximity on Bluetooth, uh, sort of chirps as they're called, I learned that's actually a technical term, in a way that's decentralized and actually fairly hard to re-identify people? Or should you prefer a proximity-based GPS system, which would allow easier re-identification, but maybe also more centralization and more involvement of public health authority? To what extent is it justifiable to pair the results from these uh, systems with access to goods like entering a public space, coming back to school or the like? When does that become coercive? So somebody has to make a decision here. There is no way to say, let's think about it some more, because to say you can do it or you can't do it, or here are the conditions. Either way, someone's going to have to make a call. And I think for me, part of what I love about the work I do is while I draw on a lot of this theoretical stuff, and I have the utmost respect for people who spend more time thinking about the theory than I do, ultimately it's to motivate a very practical decision that someone has to make. And so it's not theory for theory's sake, even though I respect that, it's theory for the sake of, of, of doing this and trying to do it the best we can, often under conditions of uncertainty, which yeah. is this other aspect that I think has been so interesting about COVID that's not true of many other public policy dilemmas we face. Yes. So you're, 
you've actually raised sort of two related questions in my mind. Um, one is that it's often tempting to think of ethics as a primarily um, internally individualized thing, right? Are you a person that is deeply ethical? Do you have ethics? Are your personal decisions really ethical? Um, there's the impact of ethics on organizations, on governments, in terms of policy, um, et cetera. So a question I have for you is, how do we bridge the individual sense of being ethical with our collective responsibility as a society that is ethical? I mean, how, and how does that connect with what our institutions, governments, et cetera, do? How do you think about that? So it's a great question. Let me attack it from a few different sides at once, if that's OK. Yeah. The first one is going to be pessimistic. And here's the pessimistic story. <laughs> okay. There's lots of studies that show does studying ethics make you behave in a way that is more pro-social and more moral? And for the most part, the evidence is not that it particularly does. That is, they do these really funny studies. And again, I know a lot of this is psychology studies that suffer from re the replicability crisis and the like. And my favorite one that I still remember has to do with instructing, you know, uh, seminarians to prepare a sermon on either uh, the Good Samaritan or something totally separate. And then setting up a confederate of somebody who falls off their crutches and needs help while they are made to rush because they play with the clocks to the, the running late to the sermon. The question would be, if I primed you about thinking about the Good Samaritan and their obligations to others, are you more likely to help the person who falls off their crutches or not? And the finding is eh, not so much, it turns out. It turns out so um, the reason, so when it comes to thinking about personal morality and our personal decisions, I think some of us in some of our moments, we can be reflective and we can draw on our ethical training. But actually, a lot of it is much more situational and a lot of it is also much more cultural. And these are very powerful impacts. So for me, the main reason to study ethics, you know, there's probably some philosophies like Buddhism, like may maybe it's a little bit different, but it's not so much to govern our individual behavior. It may be to analyze, to judge ourselves, to resent others, and to come to consider judgments. But if it's about whether my behavior is very likely to change in a major way by taking this class, I'm not so optimistic. So that's the pessimism part. Now for the optimism part. When it comes to institutions, they have huge controls about most of the decisions we make. So take universities right now at this very moment, the decision whether to reopen or not, right? And what form to reopen. There's lots of interesting legal questions about our obligations to students, anti-discrimination law, liability. There's lots of ethical questions about our responsibility to older faculty or older students versus younger students, what it means to offer an education, what the role of a university is, what are our obligations to our staff. Good ethicists, I think, to, and this is the lawyer in me talking because lawyers are obsessed with institutions. We take seriously the institutional structures that exist rather than saying idealizing them. So, you know, Rawls and others have these distinctions between ideal justice and non-ideal justice. I think for the most part, lawyer, lawyers and bioethicists live deeply in the non-ideal world, right? And to say, we have existing institutions, they can bend, they can move, but given these institutions, how do we change them as much as we can bend them towards justice even if they're not the institutions we would have chosen ourselves or completely redesigned. So there's always this tension between the revisionist impulse, everything is up for grabs on the table, versus the tinkerer impulse, let's try to fix this small thing. And the last thing I'll say on this is, I think very good ethics takes seriously the idea that the ethical principles might be different at different levels of institutional design. So just to give an example, um, when there's a decision about what an individual physician ought to do in terms of resource allocation for an individual patient who is her patient, uh, uh, there's one question. Do I do the most for my, for my patient? Do I advocate? Do I fight? You can say, well, actually, it's inappropriate to consider X, Y, and Z at that level. But then say, when it comes to the level of what the hospital policy is, or what the level of Medicare or Medicaid the funder is, or the policy question of how much we should allocate in the healthcare budget towards healthcare versus education, that such principles might be appropriate. And the idea is at different levels of institutions, there may be different sets of policies and ethical theories that are useful. 
And that's not theoretically beautiful, right? It's not, uh, what was it that the famous phrase in biology, uh, you know, phy phylectomy, phy philology reproduces. So this idea, you, yes. you, you know the phrase, you can yes. tell me what it is. This idea that we have this fractal yes. nature. It's yes. not that, it's a mishmash, but it takes seriously the nature of institutions. What's the phrase? If you tell it to me. But, 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 but so I think, I mean, it, it, what you're talking about is in terms of phylogeny and, phen phylogeny and phenotype. Exactly. Sort of chain. But, um, but one thing, though, Glenn, that you've raised in my mind, and it's something that I'm kind of taking advantage of actually having you on the call because I'd love your advice on this. Um, but I think it's something that a lot of folks face. So in my own courses, I really try to get students to think about sort of the ethical implications of a particular case, for example, in global health that they're thinking about. And what can sometimes happen is that in a world where there's quite a bit of uncertainty, where the information is, impartial, is partial, as you mentioned, and where things are changing, right? The ground is moving under your feet. What can sometimes happen is that students fall into what I think of as a floating mode in that you never land. So that students become very adept. And I think personally, we become adept at saying, well, here's the issue. And we could look at it this way and think that. We could look at it from this perspective and think something else, but you actually don't land. And so, and this point has been raised that quite often with ethical discussions, be it in a classroom or with your family or your best friends, there's a risk of not landing. And so I'm curious from your perspective as an ethicist, is it the case that we don't land or if the hope is that maybe we can land, what does landing look like? Yeah, so great question. So I'm reminded of one exercise we do in one of my classes, which involves allocating a scarce drug for multi between multiple you know, patients that we've given these small vignettes about, about their lives. And yes. One of the instructions we give the students, which I think is interesting, is, by the way, if your small group cannot agree on the rank ordering of these people, we will basically let another group allocate it instead of you, right? So this idea that to drive home this idea that if you stand by on the wayside in terms of the way in which when these discussions are being made and you can't come to a conclusion, you can't make an ultimate recommendation while recognizing the flaws and the problems, but an ultimate recommendation, somebody else will and somebody else who you might think gets it wrong in a much deeper way than you do, right? So this is, uh, I think, a good action forcing uh, technique. Right. So I think, you know, for me, what I often tell students, and this is more about legal reasoning, but it works for ethical reasoning, is that this kind of reasoning doesn't always get us to a single right answer, but it's usually pretty good at eliminating a very large number of wrong answers. And even if you can get yourself to the idea that there are two or three defensible ways to do this, and we're going to have to have a choice between them, that often is a lot of work that has been done. My yes. old friend, now retired, Norm Daniels, uh, on the public health uh, faculty, has this interesting thing where he believes that some very difficult questions don't have a right answer. They have tons of wrong answers, but we've eliminated it down to a few right answers. And at that point, philosophy has to give way, he believes, to a certain extent, to politics, right, or to discourse. And the idea would be a polity could choose between two or three decently good answers, and as between them make decisions through deliberative democracy or other forms of engagement that are not deeply ethical, philosophical in the traditional sense. And to me, that's just a useful thing is to get students to realize, because we have a lot of skeptics, and I think part of the law school method about the law is to encourage a certain skepticism about traditional decision-making. But what I remind them is that they are often skeptical as between two very close, possible answers, but they've actually indirectly ruled out thousands and thousands of answers that are inappropriate. And that's a lot of work to do that. And we should pat ourselves on the back for that work, even in cases where we can't quite get it down to a single right answer. Yes, yes. So I think in some ways what you're describing is very much, and of course this makes sense, since science is built on sort of a philosophy of logic, et cetera, it is very much the scientific process, right? sort of the process of elimination of sort of extraneous possibilities to come down to things where your decision can be more informed. So um, 
So going back to COVID-19, I have two related questions that I'd like to ask you. A lot is being said right now that the COVID-19 pandemic will change us forever, will change how we live, etc., how we think forever. Coupled with that is often this notion of a new normal. And <laughs> I've had some interesting debates, both with students and with friends and colleagues, about this notion of the new normal as something that the pandemic does to you or something that you become an active agent in making in response to the pandemic. So two related questions. One, as the COVID-19 pandemic, together with how we work in, its, in response to it, creates the new normal. From your fields, from your perspective, is there a landmine sitting there on the path to the new normal that we should look out for? My first question. And, and the second related question is, what do you think, and actually, you know, sort of making it personal, because I know how action-oriented you are, what will you be doing to help make the new normal a better normal? Great questions and tough questions. Okay. Yeah, tough ones. So, <laughs> in terms of a landmine, here's my feeling about the biggest landmine. That landmine is, um, and philosophers often call this luck egalitarianism, responsibility for health, and uh, kind of com versus commitments to solidaristic thinking about health. So the landmine I see is as people start returning to work, in particular, if it turns out that uh, exposure produces Im immunity to COVID of some kind, and we start having people return to work, there'll be a huge push to kind of undo what solidaristic programs we have in place currently. And I'm thinking about paycheck extension and the like. Because I think once enough people are able to return to the workforce, there's going to be a lot more questioning about those who don't. And I think I totally understand where this is coming from. My economist friends would talk about like Laffler curves and stuff like that, and this idea of the incentive to work. And I see it, don't get me wrong, but I think there is a risk that what happens when you have people able is we forget about those who are not able for whatever reason. And we begin asking, why are they not able and judging some of those reasons in a way that's very myopic in that we look at only the exact present circumstances and we abstract, for example, from the fact that they may have an elderly parent living with them, or they may have childcare responsibilities, or they may have something else. So my landmine and my caution would be, as we move back, that the longer this goes on, both because of budgetary pressures, but also I think because of human psychology, when we see other people able to resume normal life, we will start having impulses that are not solidaristic to those who want to stay in their current situation. And it's appropriate to have some policies and some discourse about this, but I think we need to check what is our natural tendency, which would be to think, if I can do this, so can you. Right. And you know, I see this even in discussions on websites about faculty members and the idea of what universities will demand from faculty members in terms of whether they'll come in and what that looks like. Okay, so that's the landmine in my view. A forget, you know, this has been an amazing moment for solidarity in many ways. I think it will actually be quite transformative. So maybe this is transitioning now to your second question, which is what do I what am I going to do practically? And what do I think the what makes me hopeful maybe is a way of putting this yes. about this crisis. So I, you know, I grew up in Canada. I grew up in a universal healthcare system. I whenever my parents recently became uh, green card holders, and they've now encountered the U.S. healthcare system. It's been fascinating. I've been here for 20 years, so I take a lot of it for granted, but to see it through someone else's eyes. <laughs> I think that there is a real recognition about just how precarious some people's lives are in terms of how close many of our brothers and sisters live to the edge in terms of their finances, their health and the like, and just the way in which the COVID period, how many people have bankrupted personally and food bank usage. And I think there's a real moment, especially in healthcare, for uh, a pivot towards a much more solidaristic and universalized conception of who has healthcare. Now, I think to some extent, it's, uh, 
based a little bit on a misunderstanding in that, um, but it's a useful misunderstanding perhaps to capitalize from a political point of view, maybe not from a philosophical point of view, which is to say, would COVID have looked radically different had the Bernie Sanders, Medicare for all been in place, right? I have my doubts in some things because the kinds of healthcare needs that COVID kind of highlighted are a little bit different than what most people think the universal healthcare system is going to do. Another way of putting it is even universal healthcare systems have been rocked by COVID. Yes. But I do think the experience of suddenly everybody feeling vulnerable and feeling the vulnerability that the sick and in particularly the working poor have felt their entire lives in America when it comes to healthcare, I think has opened up a political space and a discursive moment where we can talk a little bit about what we owe each other when it comes to healthcare. And I think, for example, um, much of the discourse of the last four years on the Affordable Care Act will look very different in the next year and even in this coming election cycle than it has in the past because of this inflection moment and this encounter with the dread of death and sickness. Yeah. And, you know, concomitantly, our attitude towards healthcare workers and what they do, and what it means, not just the physicians, but the orderlies and the janitors in this space. So that's what leaves me hopeful. If you ask me where I would spend my energy on maybe the political side of me, it would probably be on those issues. Ah, yes, fantastic. It's, it's interesting how, how we understand who and what is essential to us has changed, right, thanks to, thanks to the pandemic. So switching gears a little bit to Glenn, the person. <laughs> so Glenn, when you're not writing books, when you're not writing amicus briefs that are incredibly important, um, when you're not teaching, um, when you're not giving talks on your field, what does Glenn do? For fun? You know, I mean, what, yeah. What's another facet of you? Absolutely. So I love I love to travel. This has been the period of time where that's not been taking place. So that's been interesting. Right. Uh, I'm married to a uh, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker. So I love film, luckily, and I love television. I watch a lot of bad television. I'm just going to say it out there now that sometimes I just literally want to turn my brain off. So I actually love lots of things. Maybe not truly bad. Like we're not talking uh, you know, the worst reality TV shows. Right. But we're talking lots of stuff that's not very good. I watch a lot of good television too. Yeah. I actually love video games, which is, I think, as an adult man, this is surprising to say, but I find that they are an incredible stress release for me. Yeah. And then I love reading and theater. Those are probably the things that I like the best. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, believe me, I'm completely sympathetic on the, what would be considered sort of populist, maybe somewhat trashy film and TV. For me, that is how I turn my brain off as well and just relax, right? And I'm sort of in the moment. So really at another point, we should talk about the series that we're totally obsessed with. Exactly. At moment, because I have several. <laughs> so um, Glenn, it's, if you, once again, going back to your history, um, it's fair to say that for nearly all of us, we come to a crossroads and in fact, several crossroads where we turn left instead of right or right instead of left. And one can trace back how that decision sort of leads you to where you are today. Um, I know that for myself, I can think of a couple of places where if I had gone left instead of right or right instead of left, in the parallel universe multiverse, Rob Blue would be very different in some ways and would be doing something quite different. Can you think back to a crossroads in your past or if you'd gone left instead of right, the Glenn we'd be talking to today would not be a lawyer, would not be at Harvard Law School, would not be sort of someone interested in ethics, but would be different, would be doing something else. Yes, fascinating. So it's funny, I just finished the television show Debs, which is the Alex Garland show, and a lot of it is about, well, I don't want to ruin it, but let's just say the question of possible worlds comes up and what and determinism and different theories about possible worlds, which was interesting. So the idea of imagining it. You know, when I was young, so, uh, you know, I should say a little bit about biography. Neither of my parents finished high school, both very successful uh, people and, you know, amazing and smart, but neither of them had educational opportunities. So education was a huge piece of what they emphasize in my upbringing. When I was younger, though, my parents thought I might become a rabbi. 
And I think there is a bit of a pastoral aspect to that, like maybe not rabbi, but like psychologist or clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. I could imagine a version of my life where uh, I leaned in even more than I do now. Being a teacher and a professor is pastoral in some ways, but leaning in much more heavily towards that side of me. So I could imagine a version of my life where I ended up, uh, you know, helping people in that much more direct services sort of way. And probably when I decided to go to grad school for law, because I did my undergraduate in philosophy and psychology, I guess like, all right, I kept both kind of parts of my brain and parts of myself open in this way. When I decided to go to grad school for law, that was really a point where I shut down that path and went to this path. So maybe that would be the alternative version of me, would be a clinical psychologist or maybe even a rabbi. Yeah. So it's interesting, though, because, I mean, and as is often the case in sort of um, parallel universe, multiverse tales, there's differences, but there's sort of a Venn diagram overlap or commonality that actually doesn't change. So what you're saying is both different and not. And I think so in the multiverse idea, that would probably work. <laughs> I think it certainly makes sense. Um, so one of the taglines that um, Lab Exchange uses is this idea of learning without living. But at the same time, I think it's quite true that for everyone, you reach a point in your life where there's a hurdle you had to overcome. There's a limitation you had to really force against and shove against. Um, and then in some ways, that was critical to who you are today. Can you share with us a hurdle or a limit that you overcame in your past? Sure. So... I think like many very successful academic people, I suffer from kind of anxiety over deadlines and getting things done. And there was definitely a period in my life where I found, this is like very early when I was a kid even, I remember in grade five, I had like a meltdown, like a panic attack meltdown over a school project that, you know, you know I, I took this the most serious thing in the world because that's the kind of kid I was. I was extremely serious, extremely studious. And, you know, the same self-talk that a lot of people have, right? I must be perfect at everything. I cannot screw up. I cannot, you know, fail the idea of, you know, this magnification in my mind. So I think for me, the biggest challenge I've ever had in my life has been trying to keep my level of anxiety over things in what I call the adaptive zone. And some people might, you know, not like that term because they might say anxiety itself is always, but you get the idea. And this idea of managing my anxiety. Because I often tell my students, the ideal amount of stress to have is not zero and it's not 100. There's somewhere in that zone where you are your best self. And I think for me, the biggest challenge I've, ever, I've had in my life over time, you know, people say, you are your worst enemy. And I think I am. But it's definitely in, in, in my level of anxiety and stress over things that I have to do. And you know, it's caused me to be very productive, I think, because when things land on my plate, I feel anxious about it. I want to get on. This is very, I feel a little bit like the hamster in the hamster wheel, constantly <laughs> running. But instead of just, you know, producing electricity, I'm producing scholarly work and the like. But yeah. my message to most people would be, it is doable. Some of us will need, you know, medications. Some of us will need psychotherapy. Some of us will need a great partner. Some of us will need to just kind of, you know, realize and to fail and to screw up something and realize that the catastrophe didn't happen. But that I think for many people, uh, especially in, in, in academia, anxiety can be crippling and perfectionism can be crippling. And getting over that, that hump is very difficult, but it is kind of essential in being successful in, in our line of work. Of course. So thank you so much for sharing something so personal and for sort of wrapping it in really great advice, right? In terms of how that hurdle can be not just overcome, but in some ways leveraged and understood. That's the hope. Right, in the, in the context of, of how you do your work. So, Glenn, thank you so much for spending the time with the exchange because um, I know that our audience will really appreciate sort of the gems that you've shared with us today. So I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. What a great series.